let's see. Good evening. Um, if uh, you don't mind, uh, everybody but um, uh, former mayor should uh, turn, well, and Bart and I should turn off their um, video and audio for the time being, just so that we can focus on our speaker. Um, okay. And then afterwards, when we do the Q&A, you can all come back on and chat and everything. Um, uh, Just Barbara a second. Legend. Okay, you're fine. Um, so this is the Pandemic Play Reading Series. Uh, I started this group specifically for theater artists back in um, at the end of March. So I started it pretty quickly. But um, Don Bartolo has uh, started uh, doing social justice work during the series. So we've had Tuesday night series uh, with um, readings from Frederick Douglass debates, James Baldwin debates, um, various uh, other um, items of interest. And so tonight we have um, Bill Johnson to talk to us about the Ro uh, Rochester's Commission on Racial and Structural Equity. Um, now, I did tell you to turn your camera and audio off. Uh, it also reduces echo and extraneous noise because there's always some pet or something that makes noise. Um, just to let you know, if you're not familiar with Zoom yet, uh, there are times when we could have lag. Someone might drop out and need to log back in. Um, it's not perfect, but here we have it. Now there is chat at the bottom. We probably won't be looking at it much during um, the presentation, but if you want to write uh, questions for later, um, that's fine. If you do have a technical difficulty, you can chat privately with me and I will see if there's something I can do. Um, there is a d discussion after the show. Of course, we hope you stay. If you don't, we won't feel insulted. Um, and that's it for the housekeeping. Now, uh, Don Bartolo, who's producing uh, this series, would like to say a word. Thank you, Amy. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Once again, we have a very good crowd. Tonight, we are fortunate to have one of the co-leaders of the Racial and Structural Equity Commission. And just a quick word, that, that commission was created by our Mayor Lovely Warren and the County Executive Adam Bell in June. And I'll let, I'll let uh, Bill tell you more about it. But our goals tonight are to find out about the commission, to see what their purposes are, and what they might be working on, and how you might be able to get involved. It is with a great deal of pleasure that I invite Mr. Johnson on. I first met him in the 70s when he was the head of the Action for a Better Community. And Currently, he has left his position at RIT. He's the chief executive officer, officer of Strategic Community uh, Intervention, LLC. And he was the 64th mayor of Rochester. I give you Bill Johnson. Thank you very much, Don. And thank all of you for coming. Uh, I, I was checking the... Uh, checking the participant list, and I know that at least one of our commissioners has joined this discussion, Lewis, Omer, uh, Omer oh, Lewis, I'm messing your name up. Um, uh, uh, Lewis is here. I see a couple of volunteers, uh, John uh, Strazabosco, who's on one of our working groups. And I'm going to explain the, um, I'm going to explain the structure, and there are probably some of you who are on other working groups that I'm not quite familiar with yet. I'll tell you why. But as, as Don indicated, um, the mayor and the county executive jointly convened this task force back in June. They appointed three co-chairs um, um, and Dr. Muhammad Shafiq, who's a professor out at Nazareth College and uh, an interfaith leader in this community that I've worked with for over 25 years, and Arlene Santiago, uh, who is a leader in her own right. She is, um, she is a, a leader in the Latino community. 
She has chaired several nonprofit boards and she works, her day job is with Eastman Saving and Loan. She is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel. So we were charged, the three of us, working with the staff, which both the mayor and the county executive assigned to us to work on the structure of this commission. It was already determined that the mayor and the county executive would jointly appoint 21 other citizens from the community uh, to work uh, with us. Those appointments were ratified and made on August the 10th. And since that day, for now about the last seven, six or seven weeks, the commission has been hard at work. We divided up into nine working groups, um, subject matter working groups, policing as obviously the, the, the leading one, but uh, you know, it is the one that has attracted the most interest. We have another a working group on criminal justice, which looks at all of the other component parts of the criminal justice system in this community. And not just in the city, but in the towns and the villages, uh, there's a very elaborate system of, uh, of, of uh, town courts uh, that exists. Uh, and we're looking to see whether there are any disparities in the way uh, treatment is afforded people who are standing in front of town court as, as opposed to people who are standing at city court and county court. Uh, we have a health working group. It looks at the whole area of health care. We have a mental health and addiction services working group, which actually became extremely important after the Daniel Prude case became public. Because as you know, that's at the root cause of this case, the way Mr. Prude was treated while in the custody of the Rochester Police Department, as well as Strong Memorial Hospital. Uh, we have a health and social serv services working group. We have an education working group. We have job creation. We have housing. We have economic development. And I believe I've got all nine of them. Did I get them all, Luis? Did I miss some? But I think there, there are nine. You can go to our website, which is www.rockrays.com, and you will see a full description of the um, of the um, of the commission and how our work is divided. We are uh, uh, set up to provide a set of recommendations to the city and the county. In February, we were given a six month time period, all of us recognize that the work of identifying uh, racial uh, barriers, racial and racist laws and discriminatory laws and structures that exist which uh, inhibit uh, equitable treatment, we know that that work cannot be addressed thoroughly in a six month time frame. But we do know and we feel that we can begin to uh, set the parameters, uh, identify key areas, uh, and begin to make some preliminary uh, recommendations uh, for structural change. Uh, we believe that that is possible. One of the areas that obviously has is time sensitive is that the governor put out an executive order in June requiring every police agency in New York State to submit a plan for restructuring and reform of, of their policing services. And those plans are due to Albany by April 1st. So we, so we know that there are things that we can find, we can begin to examine those and begin to make significant and, and lasting recommendations. We would do not intend to do this just among ourselves. The way we are set up is that we have invited our citizens to join our working groups. So far, we have about 200 uh, or so citizens. The names of those individuals and the working groups are going to be posted hopefully by the end of this week. So you'll be able to go to the website and see exactly who is involved. Now, the key part of this is the elaborate plans for community engagement that we are working on. Uh, 
we even uh, under COVID restrictions, we are planned to do a significant and comprehensive reach out into the community uh, to solicit not merely feedback, not, solic not merely people's personal stories, but to really encourage people to offer solutions to many of these vexing problems, offer proposals. There are groups in the community which have been working on some of these issues for months now. Uh, the, the commission is not displacing any of those efforts. All of the activist groups that have been in the, uh, in the streets focusing attention on a lot of these injustices, we are saying to them, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if they have proposals, we've heard things about defunding the police. We heard things about reforming the police, re-envisioning the police. We, t we heard things about how you, you can reorganize basic services like mental health, health services to include different components of involvement and training. So any, anyone in the community, whether they are a private citizen, whether they are part of an established group, whether they are an academic, a researcher, whatever, uh, the opportunity will be presented to them uh, hopefully during the months, well, not hopefully, we plan for this during the months of November and December to go out, do our fact finding, do, go out and do our community outreach and to give serious attention to the proposals that people will bring to us. And then of course, in the months of January and February, we'll be, we will be putting together our recommendations. The, the commissioners will be pouring over the body of work that has come to us and decide in what framework we're going to make these recommendations. It's very, very important to note, and, and a lot of this is born out of experience. And it's been my either my fortune or misfortune to serve on a fair number of these advisory committees and commissions over the years. Some of them have been well received. Some of the work that has been put forward has been followed up on. And the organizations that have essentially uh, established these groups have been very open and receptive to the ideas that have come from these groups. And yet I've been on other advisory committees, task force commissions, where people have worked zealously, have worked seriously to produce outstanding recommendations. And those recommendations were pretty much dead on arrival because maybe they did not comport with the expectations of the, of the originator of the, of, the, uh, of the parties that formed the group. Uh, or maybe they never had any serious intention of doing anything in the first place. Well, having been a part of that, of those various uh, situations, I know, and I told this to the mayor at the time she asked me to serve, I'm not serving on any, on any rubber stamping group. I'm not serving on any group uh, whose, wish, uh, whose views are not gonna be respected. So our one way that we intend to make sure that this work does not get dismissed, does not get tossed, is at the very same time we are releasing the report to the mayor, the city council, to the county executive, and the county legislature, we will issue the report to the community. And there are some models we can look at. One of the things, for example, I was involved with back in the 80s, which was a very comprehensive community engagement effort, was what went under the label of call to action. It was a major look, and I see Don Dramasich is on this call. Don will remember that work uh, that went into it. We, we had uh, hundreds and hundreds of people who, who came together and created ideas that would lead to a high level of quality education in the Rochester Public Schools. Now, history will look back and say that, that, that a lot of what we uh, found in that effort and established in that effort was put in place. Some of it was derailed, uh, but we certainly know that one of the reasons that that work went as far as it did was because we released it to the public. It was in a huge, uh, uh, public uh, presentation, all of the news media got these recommendations and they tracked these results for months and years to come. I anticipate something like that happening 
with the raise uh, a commission. Uh, let me just touch on the highlights, and I think that uh, a lot of the details will be filled in by the questions that you will pose, and um, I will be happy, and I think Luis will be happy to chime in as well, and even our volunteers who are on uh, the working uh, groups. Um, the, uh, the groups are meeting uh, on, a, on, on a pretty regular basis, and tomorrow uh, we, we, we have, um, we have uh, by weekly meetings of the commission. Every two weeks, the commission gathers and we are receiving reports from the working groups. We pretty much delegate a lot of operational authority to the working groups so that they are, they have been in the process of brainstorming. As I say, they opened it up. They received um, uh, uh, people who volunteered to come on. Some of these groups have as many as 25 or 30 members. Some are smaller. But I have been uh, 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 involved with three of these groups, and I can attest that the matter, it doesn't matter how many people are engaged, these people are vigorously involved, and, and I've just been impressed with the, with the commitment that they bring. So we got nine working groups. We have three co-chairs. Each of the co-chairs is assigned three of these working groups. And uh, I, have, uh, I have a policing, uh, criminal justice and job creation. The job creation uh, group just met uh, at noon today by by Zoom. I sat in on that on that meeting. Uh, uh, the uh, the policing group uh, met uh, a few days ago. Uh, I sat in on that meeting. They have divided themselves up into subgroups. They are beginning to identify key issues that they want to delve more deeply into. And they will now help us to create this master work plan that we will look at and determine how we will proceed. As you can imagine, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of keen interest. One of the things that we have to decide is how we organize our community engagement work. Uh, we don't want to have so many uh, uh, town hall meetings and other public things that we essentially overwhelm the public. So we re really want to organize those. We will be looking after we receive the reports tomorrow, how we can organize this work in a logical fashion so that we might actually schedule uh, a, a series of town halls where more than one subject area is covered during the course of the evening. We're looking at uh, doing surveys. We're looking at uh, having public hearings where people can come and present their expert testimony. When I say expert, I don't mean people who are degreed in credentials, but people will come with a proposal that they've worked on uh, in conjunction with uh, other people in the community, and they will present that, and we will receive those. And then, of course, we will have to uh, uh, figure out a way to put it in a framework. I'm not, I'm not going to set any minimum number of recommendations that can come out of this work. I cite frequently one of the first commissions I served on after I came to Rochester. Oh, by the way, Don, you said I was at Action for a Better Community, but it was actually at the Urban League. And uh, I uh, uh, served, was appointed to a commission along with Jim McCullough, who was uh, the late great Jim McCullough, who was the executive director of uh, ABC and several other community leaders, uh, uh, law enforcement officials and the like. The city council in 1975 appointed a citizens commission to examine the, uh, thoroughly examine the practices, policies, and regulations that guided the Rochester Police Department in the aftermath of the horrendous killing of a young black housewife, 19 years old, Denise Hawkins, who was killed by a police officer after she called for help because she was engaged in a domestic dispute with her husband. Unfortunately, the circumstances were, were rushed. And when the officers arrived to help her, what they saw was a young woman who had a butcher knife in her hand. She was trying to ward off her assailant. The officer shot and killed her on the spot. And so that, that created about as much of an uproar in the community in 1975 
as the events around the death of Daniel Prude have uh, been created here uh, contemporaneously. The mayor and the city council appointed this commission, gave us a complete authority to examine every aspect of the operations of the Rochester Police Department, including the procedures and the policies, guiding the use of force, the kind of training that officers receive, the kind of background checks, uh, 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 the, the way officers were assigned to work out in the field, uh, promotional policies. One of the things that came out of that was a consent decree uh, that was issued in 1976 that said that the Rochester Police Department needed to create a more diverse, racially diverse department. So, so, so this was uh, an, uh, uh, a very intensive, deep dive into the Rochester Police Department. Now, why am I citing this? Well, we, didn't, we weren't put under any constraint of time. As I recall, it took us about a year to do our work. We, we, we did a lot of the kind of community engagement that we're talking about here. We, we met with key people in the community. We met with people in the, the police department. We met with people in the district attorney's office and, the, and judges and the like. One of our uh, co-chairs was Judge Willis, uh, who at the time was a family court judge. Uh, the other co-chair was Charles Crimmy, who was a prominent criminal defense lawyer in the city. We took our time. We did a thorough examination. And we came up with, as I recall, about 98 separate recommendations. And you can get a copy of that report. Uh, it still exists. We handed that report out to members, certain members of our commission, the ones who were dealing with policing. They all received it. But if you contact City Hall, you can get that report called the Final Report of the Citizens Commission on Police Affairs. And why, and why I cite that is not for historical reasons, but to say, that work can be done if you give it enough time and if you allow the work to, to, uh, to be conducted without any interference. We never got any direction from City Hall to tell us what we could or could not do. Uh, we never, were never told to speed it up. We're taking too much time. We got resources that we asked for. We had expert consultants working with us. And if we needed to get data, if we needed to look at uh, case uh, uh, studies from other communities, uh, we had every resource that was uh, that could be made available to us. We expect that similar things are happening here, and we're already seeing it. We have, for example, the services of the Center for Governmental Research that is assisting our work. We uh, have funds, and we use those funds to hire six very top-notch uh, college and graduate students who work as interns and who do a lot of our legwork in terms of researching, uh, developing concept papers uh, for the, the, the co-chairs. Each co-chair has two interns assigned to us. And just last week, uh, the Mayor Warren uh, went before a City Council Public Safety uh, Youth and Recreation Services Committee to uh, present an idea she had for bringing in a major law firm out of Washington, D.C. to assist in the whole policing area. And this firm has had extensive involvement in, in pattern and practices cases in police departments across the country, as well as in consent decrees. Now, both patterns and practices and consent decrees were effective tools used by both the George W. Bush and the Obama administrations to actually uh, try to bring uh, police departments in line with contemporary practices where there had been serious allegations of abuse of authority and cases of where deadly use of force uh, uh, was involved. Generally speaking, after some of the more controversial shootings, the Justice Department intervened. One of the first things the Trump administration did and under Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, was to completely abolish that section of the Justice Department. So there hasn't been any um, consent decrees coming out of the U.S. Department of Justice in the last three and a half years. We hope that that is going to change. But this firm uh, that, um, that the mayor is recommending uh, is one that has tremendous experience in that area. Uh, this morning, I had a, got a call uh, from the local uh, New York State Attorney's General's Office 
there's a team of lawyers in that office that they, and I was told by Ted O'Brien, uh, who has that office, that they have their investigation, which the attorney general is conducting and in looking into uh, how Daniel Pru died, whether or not there can be any criminal charges brought in that matter. But there's another group of attorneys in that office that is looking to find ways to recommend improvements in practices and policies. And I'm going to be, uh, we're going to start meeting with that group to determine if, there, if that is a resource that we can bring in. I just got a call earlier today. There's a, I'm just telling you this to tell you how much real interest there is in this work. Uh, from my former corporation counsel, who was corporation counsel for the 12 years that I was mayor, she's now uh, on the faculty of the Albany Law School. She's setting up a meeting that I can talk with the dean of the Albany Law School to determine if there are resources within the Albany Law School. So not only that, uh, we put out an invitation to Black Lives Matter, uh, to uh, Rock the Future, and to all of these other activist groups to uh, bring that proposals. We invite them to share, come in and talk to us, and at an appropriate time, we hope that there will be a dialogue uh, with us. The Police Accountability Board, which was just created within the last year, which is really still trying to get organized. I'm going to be reaching out to the chairman of the Police Accountability Board because we said right from the beginning that nothing that this commission was going to do would interfere, overstep, intercede uh, with the uh, obligations and responsibilities of the Police Accountability Board. And finally, there are a number of investigations that are going on. We try to stay clear of those investigations. Uh, we are not a government agency. We are a, a, an independent citizens advisory a board. Uh, we don't have subpoena power, uh, but we don't work for either the mayor or the county executive. So while we are cognizant of all of this activity that is going on in the community, we really want to be in a position where we can receive any product from that work which can be used to strengthen or inform any of the recommendations that will come out of this process. So I know I was talking fast. I'm looking at my clock. It's 8.02. And I know uh, that we want to get off so we can see this debate. So I, th I think we've got a good 45 minutes or so that I can respond to any questions. And Luis, I'll extend you an invitation and again, if you want to respond to any of these questions, feel free to do so as a member of the commission. Uh, thank you. I also want to point out that Denicia Ortiz, the other commissioner who has been tasked with working uh, in the education uh, work group, has also joined the thank call. Thank you. I just, I just see Denisha's name for the first time. Thank you so much for, for pointing That's that fine. out, Luis. Thank you. Any other commissioners on this call? I know there's some volunteers. Why don't the people who are volunteering on these committees, like John Strauss of Bosco and others, if you are volunteering on a committee, why don't you, you mind if they do that, Don, if they can just identify themselves right now? Yep. You want to start Hi. off, John? Hi, I'm John Strauss of Bosco. I'm uh, on the uh, policing subgroup that uh, will be working with training and education uh, of officers. And uh, there are five people on our committee. They uh, We just met, or we'll be meeting for the first time on Zoom tomorrow as a subgroup. Um, but you're on so the policing group as well. We're on, on the policing group, yeah. Which has had about three or four meetings so far, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we have. Thank you. Uh, Don Bartolo, Bart. I'm on the education subcommittee working with Denisha and Louise. Thank you. Dan Dermasich. I'm working on the education committee as well with uh, Bart and uh, Denisha and Luis. Good to see you again, Don. Good to see you too. Jenny says hello, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening. I'm Katerina Leone Menino. I'm the principal of Rodin Rico Fermi School 17 in Rochester, and I'm also on the education subgroup. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Okay, assuming that's all, I'll, I'll, Don, how do you want to direct the question? Uh, I'm sure you're looking at the board. You can direct. I it. am. It, Bill, I've done this before. If you, if, um, 
I can see when they put their hand up. This is what we've been using. Uh, and I'll just have them uh, talk directly with you. So um, I'm going to start it off with the initial question that I've had. Bill, uh, what kind of involvement do you see from the county with the commission? Well, I think quite uh, significant. And let's say to show you how things work out. The, command, the county is in control of both human services and mental health. And the issue of uh, the, uh, the uh, deployment of trained, inter, uh, trained mental health uh, uh, professionals looms large in the Prude case. So immediately the county executive uh, brought the professionals in his operation together with the co-facilitators of our mental health and addiction services committee. And what he has done is to put that, that, that office of office of mental health has a $40 million annual budget. And what the county executive has done is to put that entire $40 million on the table to see if it can be better resourced and better deployed. Uh, the, 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 uh, the whole area of, um, of uh, juvenile justice, the county administers juvenile justice facilities. One of the co-chairs of our, two of the co-chairs of our criminal justice, uh, justice working group is Danielle Ponder, who is an assistant public defender, and Catherine Thomas, who runs the Monroe County Juvenile uh, uh, Facility out in Rush, New York. So, uh, so we have the people, and, and the county is a, a very, very active player uh, in, in, this, uh, in this discussion. Now, remember what we are tasked to do. Find laws and regulations, both at the city and the county level, that have been used to restrict uh, and prohibit access mm. and deny equity. Well, those laws are gonna have to be approved by both legislative bodies. So there are two city council people on our commission, Willie Lightfoot and Mitch Gruber, and there are two county legislators uh, on our um, um, uh, group, including Steve Brew, who is the minor, a majority leader in the Monroe County Legislature. So our view is that if you are engaged in this work, that part of what uh, is gonna fall upon him is, uh, is uh, uh, going back to his caucus and saying, there's work that's gotta be done. Frank Keoplalasi, who is a member of the Democratic minority, uh, is also on the commission. So I think that uh, what we are creating is a system where people cannot escape any of their responsibilities because they will the be engaged right up front. Okay. Okay. And has been tested. Thank you, Bill. Let's just open it up now. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Anita. Yeah. How you, you know doing? this man, Anita? I'm a part of the education group, which I I just got an um, invitation into, which I agreed to be a part for a long time because I feel all this start with education of our young people. And I feel like there are some policies and procedures that we could look closely at that really needs to be changed in the city school district. As you know, our board of education, I don't know if you know it or not, but I did some research and I found out that it started in 1972, and it'll be uh, 50 or more years old, 50 years old in two years. And I've seen, you know, certain policies and procedures that has not helped educate our young people. And I feel that we could, we got some work to do because it starts from education. My background is early child development, and I haven't changed my mission since I got involved way back in some of the things that I've been doing through the Neighbors Building Neighborhoods process, 
children's zone and a lot of different processes. I haven't changed because the, the needs have not changed. And if, unless we educate our young people, you know, in the right ways to help them be productive citizens in our society, we're gonna continue having processes like this go on and on and on and on. Because I've been a part of a process for over 20 years. I've raised uh, five kids and I have seven grandkids and I'm soon be a great grandmother. And I think it's time and it's been time for us to get going on some policy change, not only in the city school district, but along the county lines, the police department, and a lot of other areas. But I chose education because I'm an educator, and I think that we can do better. And my question is, I really hope that this time our recommendations get the full attention that it needs to bring change to our city, because this is a great city. We have a lot of potential here. And I think we have kind of slowed down in what we were doing in the past. And we need to try to move forward and bring a lot of young people that are out here right now into the process. Thank you, Anita. I know, I know I, you and I worked together on NBN for so many years, so I know your commitment. Uh, I want to see if Denisha or Luis have anything to say since this is the area that they are working in. Um, so, uh, with regard to uh, one one um, issue that you pointed out, that hoping that this time, you know, that there's more action taken based on the recommendations than in prior times. I know that Denisha and I have discussed uh, how to frame any recommendations that our working group in education provides uh, in a way that uh, the recommendations are also tied to recommended milestones uh, or some other action that, uh, that is visible and measurable uh, after the commission turns over its report. Uh, because we know that we have a limited time, only six months to take action now. And then after that, and, and even now we don't have a lot, the authority uh, to enforce the recommendations just to make them. Um, and once we hand them off, uh, we have even less authority at that point because the commission will suppose be disbanded after six months. Um, so any recommendations uh, that, that we're making, we're, we're keeping that in mind that uh, in the past recommendations have been made and action has not been taken. So we wanna, we wanna see what we can do. I see Denisha has logged in. She may have something to add to this. Yeah, just to piggyback off of Luis, I think another aspect out of this that we are expecting some other work that we probably cannot get done within the time frame that we have, um, but working closely, as Phil Johnson mentioned, with other organizations, nonprofits who are already doing this work, how can we take some of those really strong recommendations that are still viable to make changes and work with them to carry on the plan after our time is up. Um, so we're really focused, trying to focus on what are those key aspects, things that we know that we can make a significant impact and, and systematic change and keeping that focus. So, you know, here we sit on these on uh, September 29th and we say our work's going to conclude. And I, I, I want to say, I, I, I see this work going on. Uh, I, I keep us focused on the six months so we'll get our work done. But I, there's no way I think that this work can be disbanded. It may be a different group of people who pick it up and we'll certainly create a pathway uh, if we hand this off to another group so people will know where to go. But I, l let me say that some people might question why education is here. But the biggest structural barrier to inequality that exists in this community, and not only here in this country, is the way our education system is organized between various communities. So resources, as you know, are allocated disproportionately. And there are groups working out here who say, what if we could actually restructure our educational system? Now we know that's like putting your hand 
on the third rail of, of, um, of electricity. And people have been shocked, you know, but I think that there ought to be a serious discussion. And I can't predict this because if I would tell you that tonight, you said, well, hey, they've already got this plan written. And no, we don't. But we need to at least say to people, just because something looks like it's an insurmountable barrier should not be a reason why, why we're not talking about it. And I think that this community has to look at, particularly now with schools being shorted of so many resources, can we even afford the luxury of having 19 separate school districts uh, in, in this county? That is a very controversial subject, but it's one I think that has to be examined if you're talking about dealing with the structural barriers to, uh, to equitable delivery of services. Hey. I have a question. Go right ahead. Okay. So, um, first of all, I'd like to let everybody know that, that um, mission report. That, uh, We're having was, trouble hearing you, Brian. I don't know what's the, what's the issue. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So that, that commission report that uh, Mayor Johnson uh, spoke about, it's online. Uh, it's 126 pages, so if anybody want to get it, they can go online and, and get the reports uh, instead of uh, contacting City Hall and be proactive. Um, the question I have, Mayor Johnson, is that uh, too many times, um, and what Lewis says kind of uh, not frightened me, but kind of um, angered me because here we, here we are trying to do, do right um, for the systematic racism that we see in all of our structures uh, or institutions. And then he says that all the hard work that we're going to do, that he's going to pass it off and nothing is guaranteed. Nothing is, is um, for somebody who gets it and just throw it in the garbage. So, so, so my concern is how can we stop that? How can, and, and I heard you say that we're going to continue the movement, but uh, continue uh, uh, what we're doing right now. But that's my concern. We don't have any power in this group if none of my recommendations are going to be taken seriously. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, I, I, I share that concern, but I say part of the experience I've had, and I'll let Luis and others uh, talk to this, um, is that we need to make this a community-owned project, okay? We're working on behalf of the citizens of the greater Rochester community. And, and that's why we're saying, it's not gonna be a select group of people making these recommendations, it's open. So we wanna be as open and as receptive as possible. We wanna be as expansive in our recommendations. That's what I'm saying. We're not gonna say, this has got to be limited to 25 pages. It could turn out being a 500 page report as long as it has things that need to be addressed. But at that point, it can't be viewed as in the, under the control of any elected official because they come and they go, okay? Uh, we need to make it a community-owned project. And, that's, and I'm hoping that people like you and Anita and other people I know in this community who are tenacious, who will not give up, will say, no, you can't leave this, you can't leave it. We haven't finished. We have got to stay here until we finish. Oh, we know it's painful, and we know that some people don't want to deal with this, but this is, if you say you want to get rid of structural barriers, this is a barrier that's got to be done. And I think it's with that kind of commitment and tenacity that we will prevail where we might not have prevailed in the past. I'm saying that out of pure conviction in my heart because I've been around this, this circle several times. I don't want it to sound like rhetoric. Some people might think it's rhetoric, but listen, um, uh, Anita and many of, and hundreds of her colleagues did something called Neighbors Building Neighborhoods, all right? And they had the power. They actually dictated to City Hall what they wanted to see in their neighborhoods, all right? They told City Council, when you put together your budget, we've already decided we want this in our neighborhood. And they had to listen, because they had to know they had to go before those people to get reelected. And that's the kind of ownership that I want to have as a part of this process. You're going to make breath you're gonna make sure this thing gets done because you're not gonna let it go. You're not gonna let anybody throw it in the trash. And Bryant, I wanna add uh, what I 
said, uh, I understand why it will uh, cause some uh, individuals to be upset or concerned, but I say it more uh, out of a practical uh, consideration for how I believe we should frame our uh, recommendations in the sense that I don't think they, you know, I think we should, we should uh, look uh, to avoid open-ended, vague recommendations and try to have them uh, tied to milestones or some concrete actions, uh, even if, if part of it may be broader. Uh, I think that's one way to, to see whether the recommendations are actually followed and, and whether the, the outcome, uh, you know, is tied to, to the recommendations. And, Hi. I want to say, uh, Dan is next. No, Beth Bart, Katarina has had her hand up, and Gwen. Oh, sorry, Katarina. No problem. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to bring up the uh, question about uh, data sharing. So we saw this actually just play out in front of our eyes with the FIT team uh, data sharing or information sharing with RPD. And um, as a principal, I see it play out daily between our data sharing with the city of Rochester and county agencies, including Child Protectives or Office of Mental Health and Department of Human Services. Um, so I didn't see any particular element focused specifically on that, but we are currently also one of the pilot projects with the United Way Systems Integration Work Group. Um, I'm wondering if there is um, kind of a crossover element of data sharing that's included in each of these subgroups that's on race and whether that element, which is a structural element and a policy element, um, can be something that becomes part of the recommendations of each of the subgroups to create uh, systems of communication that can lead to more preventative care and preventative structures instead of those reactive um, kind of siloed approaches that we're seeing as a community. Uh, I think so. Uh, I think we will be looking, as I say, we've got nine large groups and probably as many as 30 or 40 subgroups. And so there's going to inevitably be some kind of overlap. We're, we're being very careful. But also there could be some there could be some voids, some things that are not brought up, just like you may have brought up this whole, whole issue of data sharing. I will, I will tell you, I'm almost certain that because of the way this thing played out, uh, uh, with the forensic intervention team and its director having to retire, uh, uh, because of the because of a lot of questions, but not the least of which was why was that information included in a public document? Okay, so I can almost predict that I, that Eric Kane, who is one of the co-facilitators and a leader in this field of mental health uh, our, our providers. Uh, we'll be looking at that, but not, there's the opportunity that if we don't pick it up during our first shot at it, when we have the public hearings and uh, we're getting public input, we that's, that's where somebody like you can come in and say, ah, here's something that you are missing that needs to be included in this work. So I think there are, there are ways to capture uh, uh, what's going on because of the sheer number of people that we have engaged in this work, but also the fact that we will take it to the community before it's final, before it's final, and get your get your feedback where we can further strengthen and improve this product. Dan, Dan, do uh, yes. Um, I think uh, Bill. I think it's uh, widely understood that uh, the conditions that we see within the city are directly responsible for, on a regional perspective as opposed to simply a, a city pers perspective that uh, certainly in terms of criminal justice, education, uh, jobs, everything else, it's a regional issue. And uh, for that reason, we have to have uh, the county and the whole region involved. I'm curious though, in terms of uh, using as an example, your work many years ago in terms of uh, uh, advocating for a metropolitan school district. And I'm by no means saying that that's one of the education committee's recommendations, but the attitudes at that time in terms of uh, such a 
a project, a meaningful project, were really negative uh, by many suburban areas. I'm wondering whether or not you see any change in terms of that attitude and uh, those types of perspectives by the county. Well, by county residents, I, I suspect, uh, Dan, that some of that hard resistance is still there. I'm thinking about a group uh, uh, that's been working over at Third Presbyterian. I, I, I'm, I miss it. You probably know the name of that group <laughs> that's been yeah. looking at great the schools metropolitan for all. Great schools for all. Okay. Right. And, you know, that's, that's sound work they've been doing, but it hasn't gotten a lot of broad attention or acceptance. Now, phil philosophically, I, I know I've, I, I was engaged in discussion with some people who said, oh, you got the wrong group of people involved here. You got people, I mean, they even went so far as to say, you got people who have racist uh, intentions on this commission and blah, blah, why, and they don't know anything. But part of what we have to do is to build a base for gathering public support for these recommendations, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's why I believe it was important. It was a great strategic move on the part of the mayor. She could have appointed this as a city commission. And then it would have been actually constrained in its work. Mm -hmm. So by bringing county people in, and we have a large number of people, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't exclude anybody by basis of geography. We've got several uh, non-city residents who are commissioners. Uh, we have numerous ones who are volunteers in this work. But my view is that they become advocates for the work. And uh, I, I, I say that. Um, mm -hmm that uh, having the Republican leader of the county legislature on this, on this group could be an important uh, uh, asset for us uh, uh, because of him having to go back. We need to get 15 votes in the county legislature to pass anything that, that, that applies to the county. And I think some of that will happen. So I think it's important, Dan, what you raise is very important. Not only what we frame, but how do we create the platform where we can gain broader support? Mm -hmm. And it could very well be that a lot of the people who have resisted broadening uh, and regionalizing or metropolitanizing, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the public school function. Might, this may be a moment of reckoning that they now have to reexamine their opposition uh, and determine whether or not it is not time to consider a different way of delivering public school services in Monroe County. I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that that might be one of the outcomes. Oh, Gwen had her hand up. She's had it up for a while. Yes. Gwen has had her hand up. Gwen Clifton. Okay. Hi, I'm Gwen. Thank you. Um, I'm part of the education work group. Um, I, you know what, what I had to say has been said. Um, I was concerned about um, the amount of, I, I just feel like we at a time where um, we have done all the research that we need. I mean, we've had reached research been done for years on top of years on top of years. And it's, it's really just time for action. Um, but I do understand that some of the changes that needs to be made has to be research driven and the research must be current. I get that. Um, but the city school district um, is at such a dangerous state right now. Um, I'm just concerned. Um, and I understand that this um, committee is, is looking at more than just um, the city. The city is also looking at the counties, the county as a whole. Um, but many of the things that's already has been said, um, I'm, that's where my concern is. Will we just be doing another research group with no action? Um, I think that uh, the team that I'm on, the group that I'm on, we made um, some very important points in education um, that we're gonna tackle. Um, but just like I said, um, I want to see some action. And I think that has kind of been answered already. So well, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Gwen. I hope you can leave this discussion with some, because uh, I don't interact with the education work group, 
but I hope you can leave it with some kind of calm assurance that this is not going to be a talking society. Because I agree with you. <laughs> we've talked this, right. we, we've been around, we've been dealing with education reform in this city for 40 years, all right? Uh, which is one reason I don't think we need more than six months to do this work, because as you say correctly, a lot of the data is already there. It just has to be assembled uh, in this place. And the reason I like this model is because it, the city and the county are almost obligated to do something. They may not do everything, but they can't do nothing, all right? And, 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 and the recommendations are going to them. But we're going to look at how the private sector, I mean, the whole question of job creation, right? Everybody wondered, well, why, why is that in there? But, you know, there's civil service provisions that people that keep people out of jobs. That's controlled by the county. But, you know, the, the, the city and the county government gives a lot of money to create economic development projects. And you can use that money as a lever with the people who are receiving it and say, if we're going to invest in your project, then you're going to have to invest in our city. You're going to have to figure out ways to employ city residents in these jobs because we just can't keep giving you money. So I think if we can be very creative about how we approach this work, and I think we can meet one of your primary concerns, that this is going to be action-oriented. This is definitely not going to be another piece of paper with words on it. And I tell you the same thing I told. I appreciate you, sir, serving on this committee. Same thing I said to Brian. You are going to be largely, people like you are going to be largely responsible for how far this work goes, because you're not going to just let it sit. You're not giving and, up. And, and I just want to say one more thing. Um, I was a proud resident of the city of Rochester for 16 years before I moved to the town of Chai Lai. Mm -hmm. um, and my number one reason for leaving my beautiful home in the city of Rochester was because I was concerned about my daughter's education. Yes. It really pushed me to sell my home and to move to Chai Lai. I just like, I, I got tired of paying um, for a uh, private school and just all of those different things. Um, and I can have a win-win in the suburbs. Yes. And it's unfortunate because I was active in my, in the city. Um, I'm active in Chai Lai also. I ran for Chai Lai Town Board and I'm on every committee because there's issues there as well. Yes. Um, but the city is losing uh, good citizens that want to see a change, but they're tired. And yes. I just, like I said, I, I just could not, I, as far as uh, personally for myself, I'm the first to graduate from um, college um, and reach higher education. I'm the first in my family and my children are my legacy. Yes. And, and, and it, and it's sad. It, it makes me sad that we have to leave in order to to make sure our children make it so i hope and i hope that um that we will continue to push um for uh, action I, I really do because even though i have left i have not forgotten my nieces my nephews and the people that my old neighborhood of where i left and even uh school number 17 which i'm a graduate from that school too and from elementary i want to go back um but i i cannot forget those that that's still there that's still in the struggle and we yeah. we need to change because i've never seen our city in such a state that it's in now. And I'm concerned whether I left or not, I'm still concerned. Yeah. And that's why I'm here today, just to let you know. Thank you, Gwen. I can't add a word to what you said. I, I concur 100% with that sentiment. And we got we to gotta figure out ways to keep people from leaving the city for very good reasons like you left. Nobody's going to oh. fault you for getting a good education for your children. Thank I'll you. Anita? Yes, um, I just wanted to say I understand you and why you had to leave for your children. But I was also a parent in the city of Rochester, Rochester City School System. And I just was involved every day. And what I did was evaluate my own children's level of learning and their abilities and what couldn't, give, what couldn't be given to my children by the city school district. I had to make sure they got it at home. 
And when the test they gave my children told, told them that they, could, they were failing, I told them, no, no, you're not. It's the way they're teaching you because everybody don't learn the same way. And both of these children who they said would not pass their fourth grade ELA test end up being valedictorians by the 12th grade. And I know that there is a way for us to change some policies and get true parental involvement in our schools and make real recommendations for change. Because so goes the city, so goes the suburb, so goes the regions all around there. So we must make moves if we want our city of Rochester and the rest of our state to be the quality place that it should be in the first place, we're gonna to have to start with our educational system and police reform. And there's ways to do that through education. That's why I decided to be on this committee. I could have been on the police committee, but I felt that education and the education of our young people, whether in the city or the suburbs is very important because you could live in a box, but once you come out of that box, you're gonna get some reality checks, what's going on in real life. So I hope that this time, because I was involved in the Neighbors Building Neighborhoods process and we had, I had over 3,000 people from my neighborhood working with me on certain initiatives and it did work. Every plan that I created, I implemented. And I believe that we can implement some of these processes and these plans and these procedures that we're gonna try to create here. And it is up to the citizens. The way we make it work is citizen engagement and involvement in the process and being open with the process. We can't keep secrets. If you don't tell the citizens what's going on, they're not gonna believe you. If you tell them what's going on, you tell them the truth, they will believe you and they will get involved. I've had over 150 parents come to a meeting that I called on a summer night to get involved in the city school district. It's a matter of making policies and make it friendly and a friendly atmosphere for people to be involved in these processes. And that's, that's all I can say about it. But I know that I've been on a lot of processes and it's very hard. I've been beat down through some processes, but I know some good has come out of it. I know whether it changed the city or not, it changed some young people's lives and it made their family and their life more prosperous. And this is opportunity for all of us to try to make change for our, not only our city, but our county. And I hope that we can do it together. Katarina, I see that your hand is still up. Do you have another question? If not, Beth? I think it's up, Beth, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mary Bill, for leading this effort. Uh, I also have been involved in educational reform for probably 30 years. I had a kid at school five and school 50 in Soda also raised two kids in Webster. So just to the question of what, you know, do we have to wait? Like I can hear Gwen's frustration and I have it too. Um, what we've been doing at third as we are waiting this report is uh, partnering with Rock Acts, which is a partnership of 21 faith communities. I just, you know, my friends are in faith communities around the city and they have all, dived in to uh, this effort and they're sort of waiting for direction. What we're doing at Rock Axe is holding individual superintendents accountable for their signing a statement to dis dismantle uh, structural racism. So I guess my question is uh, how best should we, this community, use this wonderful resource of the faith community? Where else would you have us um, putting our efforts at this time? Well, I believe that we need to know, uh, there are a lot of these initiatives that are operating. Um, only a few people know about them. They're very well intended and they are achieving uh, uh, some, good, some good impacts. I, I, I would, as I've said constantly with people who worry that somehow a raise is going to overshadow or displace them. I said, absolutely not. I think that if they've got ideas that they believe fall within the framework that we're trying to achieve, which is a, which is 
how do we remove these barriers? And are they legally imposed? Are they through customs or whatever? Because I don't exempt something because it's not a law on the books of the city or the county. Um, bring it, you know, work within this group. In other words, the education work group is going to really determine the educational recommendations that come out of this exercise and are included in this larger report. So I think the kind of discussion that you're having here tonight, that I'm sure you have these active discussions within your group, and as we're moving along, the final question is, the, the major question is, what are we going to include? What is, what is the message that we're trying to communicate to this larger community? And what are we prepared to invest our time and energy to ensure there's a better chance of getting implemented than any time in the past? All right? Because, I mean, I'm looking like, hey, I've been, I've been, I've been a part of this discussion in this community for almost 50 years. And I surely thought by now that I wouldn't be having some of the same conversations that I had 40, 45 years ago. And we are. And part of it is because people put a lot of energy, got something out of it, and then sort of accepted the fact that it was all done. And then there were people who were on the other side who came in and who were just as determined to dismantle what had been done as those who put it in place. That's where we have to interrupt this time. We're not going to allow somebody to come along and dismantle what we put in place. We have to create the structures, the accountability measures, however you call it, that says this is a community-owned initiative. The community has accepted it, and it's gonna, it can only go in one direction, which is forward. It cannot go sideways. It cannot go backwards. And I think we got to make that sound like modern rhetoric. And the reason I, 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 I like to see people that I've worked with in the past, because they know my reputation and I, and I know theirs, okay? I, if you tell, if you give somebody the authority, you say, look, this is your job to go get this done. And you let them do it. Anita has said it very effectively. They'll come back and it'll get done. Now, what is my responsibility as the, as the, as the mayor? To pat you on your head? or to say, yes, we're going to incorporate this. And, 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 and we finally got to a point where you could look in the city budget book and you could actually see not only there's a recommendation to do something as simple as, as create a pocket park in a, in a particular neighborhood, you could see the money that was allocated to make it happen, all right? And then what would you do next? you would actually go see the construction of that park. You would see that that park was actually brought online. That's a small example. I think in terms of, we, we created in that commission, I thank you, Brian, for, for telling me that it was online. I forgot that that was. We created in that commission a whole host of training regiments for the Rochester Police Department. We, 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 we created a whole notion about how and when an officer could use force and deadly force, all right? And you know what happened? Here's a real tragedy. Jim McCullough worked on that committee. He was chairman of that committee. And we worked on protocols. And you do you know six years after that report was adopted, a Rochester police officer killed his daughter with deadly use of force? So you say to yourself, what happened to the training? Okay, what happened to all of the safeguards we put in? Those are the things that I think we now know from experience we have to attend to this time around. And 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 I don't know I don't know most of you. I know some of you. I don't know most of you, but I'm listening to you. And I don't think you would be sitting here going to those committee meetings just because you were bored through the coronavirus. You came because you see it as an opportunity to finally get something done. And I'm telling you that from my end of the equation, I'm working with you to get something done. And done. So put it in your recommendations and challenge us to put it in the final report and then challenge the city council and the mayor and the county legislature to implement the strategies that you have outlined. That's a process. What do they say? Work the process. This is a process that we're going to work. Thank you. Bill, I want to thank you on behalf of the group. Uh, we've learned a lot and we'll be both working internally but also 
taking a look at the progress together. I want to thank everybody for coming. Look for something in two weeks on Tuesday night. Have a, have a safe night. Amy Canfield, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you for your hard work. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Thank, thank you. All right. Bye. See you soon. Invite me back, Don. We'll come back and talk some more. And I'm yeah. Six weeks I'd like to have you back, Bill. Okay, do that. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, Mr. Johnson, is it? Oh, he's gone. I wanted uh, to make sure this was okay to be public. Yes. Um, yeah. Did you? Re did we record it? I Amy? did. I did. Oh, I good, did. because I've already had requests. Yes, I was. Yeah. Good. I recorded it before I started talking. So um, I can do a public on YouTube? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for, uh, Amy, thank you for letting me know that sometimes I miss the hand up. Yes. You know, <laughs> I, know. You know, I don't mean to, but I... No, I know. So I need, thank y'all for being a part of this tonight. Yeah, and have a good night. Good night. Nice to see you. Take yep. care. Bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yeah, I'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> see you when I turn around. I'm downstairs and I'll see you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Let me see the switch chat. Okay, I will. <laughs>